that it's now time to start the week on a Tuesday. So here we are with your top stories, everything you need to know to start your Monday, Tuesday morning actually. Let's take a look. The UK National Health Service is in crisis. It's now looking to India for solutions, but the Indian Medical Association is politely declining the offer. Inauguration of the new facility at India's highest court of justice makes it more disabled friendly and a one-stop solution help desk for all pregnant women. The CGI now saying that he wants to include and make the profession more inclusive for women. One of my uh, concerns really is that while more and more women are entering the legal profession, the rate of attrition of women once they join the legal profession is high. IPL fever is all and all eyes on the big match between Chennai Super Kings and Gujarat Titans tonight. Second for the both of the teams but the highest talking point of the season so far has been Hardik Pandya. We bring you the details. Also another record there for Virat Kohli becomes the first Indian to register 150 plus scores at T20. And did you know which is the best sandwich in the world? Well, it's Mumbai's very own Vada Pao. So we went around the city to tell you which are the best places to go and get your Vada Pao from. But then, what about Shawarma? Well, Delhi is not very far behind. So there's a match going on between those two cities. A report coming up. Also on the program, all the details on the BMW iX1 in our special overdrive segment. Alright, let's begin today with an important story that's emerging from the United Kingdom. The NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, seems to be in big trouble and is now turning to India for solutions. The NHS is UK's publicly funded healthcare system and the entire population of UK is covered by the NHS and the majority of health services there are absolutely free. In fact, NHS can be described as the closest thing Britain actually has to the national religion of sorts. It's cherished deeply. Its levels of public support higher than that of the royal family as well and of many other British institutions. NHS remains the biggest source of national pride for its people and for the country, but it now stands at a critical juncture, facing challenges that require urgent attention. NHS was established post the World War II and recently the UK Prime Minister there, Rishi Sonak, whose parents were also NHS doctors and pharmacists, paid a tribute, uh, tribute to the NHS and outlined a 15-year plan aimed at recruiting hundreds and thousands of new health staff. Why? Because it is recognizing that NHS is under unprecedented strain following the pandemic. Even though the government has spent nearly 12% of its budget only on healthcare, it's a single, you know, far uh, and its single biggest item on the budget. Now, demoralized doctors, nurses have been striking for better pay at aging and unfit population uh, also needs ever more complex treatments. Cancers go undiagnosed and lack of scanners in hospitals. All of these leading to a situation that is crumbling, a crumbling healthcare infrastructure for UK. Now, Rishi Sonak, the you know, the leader there now turning to India for solutions. It is now looking at hiring 2,000 doctors from India to prevent their medical system from completely collapsing. So we found out what exactly is this. Himani has the details. Himani. 
That's right, Sonal. NHS is in crisis and needs India's help. NHS is looking to hire about 2,000 doctors from India to prevent their medical system from collapsing. These Indian doctors will be given 6 to 12 months of training and then they will start working at hospitals in Britain. These doctors won't have to uh, take the Professional and Linguistic Assessments Board or PLAB. That's the exam uh, after they finish the training. This exam is otherwise mandatory for starting clinical practice in the UK. However, these place placements do not offer permanent se settlement facilities in the UK. For many years, the NHS has struggled to address its staff shortage due to various reasons. The UK has been depending on doctors trained in other countries for many years now. This is not the first time. In fact, in 2019, it had one of the lowest numbers of doctors per capita in Europe. But now the problem has worsened significantly. According to global media, the NHS desperately needs more homegrown doctors, nurses, general physicians and dentists to prevent the crisis that could leave the NHS short of 5,71,000 staffers, which are all healthcare professionals. Minded, this isn't about shortages elsewhere. It's about the severe shortage hitting the healthcare sector. And if they don't fix this, the NHS might not be able to keep up with all the people needing care in their country, especially with the increasing demand due to the growing and aging population. While NHS is scouting for well-trained and experienced doctors from India, the question is, will India help? The IMA or the Indian Medical Association, which is the largest group representing doctors in India, is not very interested in helping UK. The reason is simple. They want NHS or any other organization to come to India to absorb young MBBS graduate doctors who are looking for jobs and not those who are already settled here and serving the Indian population. IMA has declined to participate in this initiative and in fact, IMA's national president Dr. R. V. Asokan told News 18 that they do not want to support the migration of skilled doctors as it could undermine the Indian healthcare system. The message is crisp and clear, why allow Indian doctors to leave and serve in other countries when their own nation needs them? IMA has politely declined NHS offer to join their initiative as they do not want to become part of this brain drain. Back to you. That's right, Imani. So, obviously, Indian doctors concerned that a lot of our professionally trained doctors are going to, you know, leave the country and go to the UK. But isn't there another interesting statistic here where India also in the next 10 years is going to have several unemployed doctors. We have around 706 medical colleges. So how exactly is IMA sort of answering that? That's right, Sonal. India will have more than 1 million or 10 lakh doctors unemployed in the next 10 years. In fact, the government has announced mm. more medical colleges which will further increase this problem and more fresh doctors will come from these medical colleges. To solve this issue, IM has, IM, IMA has started an employment exchange initiative at the national level even at the international level for young graduates. And hence, IMA hmm. wanted NHS to absorb these fresh graduates instead of well-trained hmm. doctors. I see. So the question is that also, how will this really be applicable? Because, Imani, uh, what IMA decides might not be mandatory on doctors, right? There might be some doctors who might still decide to go. On their individual will, if they want to go, they can go. But IMA itself is not promoting. If doctors want to apply for this, they can. I see. Interesting. Uh, yes, Interesting yes. point there. Interesting point there. Thanks, Imani, so much for joining us with the very latest. Thank you. All right, on that note, it's an interesting, fascinating story how UK is struggling for doctors. They don't know how to train doctors. They're looking to India for solution. India saying, yes, we have doctors, but we don't want to give you our very experienced doctors. We'll give you the ones who are fresh out of college and then you train them in UK. Let's see where this story actually goes and how it unfolds further. But let's move on to some really positive news coming out from our 
judiciary now, since Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrashun took over over the reins of Supreme Court, his constant vision has been to make the judiciary more and more exclusive and accessible for the have-nots in the society. In his latest endeavor now, he has come out with a new infrastructure altogether of the Supreme Court of India, which will be more inclusive, especially for the specially abled. Now, News 18's reporter spoke with him exclusively where he chalks out his plan. This is Ananya Bhatnagar in conversation with the Chief Justice of India. Access to justice might just be a very simple English phrase. However, for somebody who is seeking justice, it can be the last hope in this whole wild world. With Justice D.Y. Chandachu taking over and the Chief Justice of India, the idea of a more inclusive courtroom which could be more accessible and functional to even those who have faced difficulty or who are uh, in fact specially able was taken into consideration. The Supreme Court has now made various accessibility changes when it comes to accessing justice or approaching the topmost court of the country. In a bid to make the Supreme Court building more inclusive, tactile paths, gender-neutral toilets, braille-equipped signboards and special toilets for the differently able have been added. Low railings on ramps have also been installed to facilitate pregnant women and those using wheelchairs. These changes will be seen in both the old and the new Supreme Court building. Presently, Honorable the Chief Justice of India has created accessibility and inclusion section which looks after the implementation of recommendations which have been made in the accessibility report 2023. Uh, we are in the process of completing it by end of March and almost 80% recommendations have been implemented. Part of my uh, endeavour to promote accessibility is also to promote transparency first and foremost because it, it's when you promote transparency that you can really further accessibility. And as part of the report, uh, there have been wide-ranging uh, recommendations, recommendations which we are implementing at different layers. One layer would be in terms of physical accessibility, tactile paving, uh, proper marking of pathways, uh, hydraulic lifts. Moving on with the times is a must and modernizing judicial infrastructure is also needed to meet future challenges. The Chief Justice of India agrees. In the latest bid to make justice accessible for all, this is the new accessibility window that would be inaugurated very, very soon. The volunteers here would guide the uh, people to not only, in fact, the courts, but also to the filing counters. There would be wheelchair support and other facilities that could make justice more accessible and friendly to everybody. Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachur has been driving technological changes in the judiciary. He aims to use it to eliminate the inefficiency and opacity surrounding judicial processes. The new website we have is not only bilingual, but it has been considered uh, to make it how best we can make it accessible friendly. The images to be uploaded on our website should have captions because a screen reader which reads an image or a visually impaired person who has to uh, uh, visit our website and access the, they can't see the uh, image. So the heading defined left to right, just like in the media, in the newspaper, you see left to right, who is standing or what's happening, the description. So that practice is also there. Foremost, since we are the biggest content generator, quotes, I mean we, so we try to, have we have strict policy in a new website, no physical scanned uh, document. We try to use bond digital PDFs. And I'm very happy by the initiatives the courts have taken and the judgments that are given basically in these infrastructure things that uh, all the public buildings should be accessible to people, uh, even the courts also, so that it actually gives us a kind of a confidence. Providing earmarked spaces for senior citizens, pregnant women, differently abled persons, so on and so forth. So washrooms, uh, drinking water facilities, uh, availability of medical care. So we've been working very seriously on that. Removing barriers to justice is one of the big challenges we face today. 
and with initiatives like these, the Chief Justice of India hopes to overcome just that. With Ananya Bhatnagar, Ayushman Singh Jamwal, CNN News 18. All right, so now Supreme Court has this all new facility which is becoming more disabled friendly. But also the major issue that we have seen in our courts of justice is that more and more women do join the workforce. But there is a very high attrition as well. This initiative of making our courtrooms more women inclusive has also been taken up by the CGI. Here is what he said. One of my uh, concerns really is that while more and more women are entering the legal profession, the rate of attrition of women once they join the legal profession is high. And that is something which we have to arrest. Uh, for instance, when you look at the recruitment of district uh, judiciary at the, at the lowest level, the first level in the Indian judiciary, oh, in some states over 60% or 70% of the new recruits are women. Uh, now, those who join judicial service continue to remain in the service because the service offers a sense of security, of tenure, security of conditions of work. Uh, when it comes to the mainstream of the legal profession in terms of practicing law in courts, you lack that kind of security. So we have to therefore create a very safe, welcoming and, uh, and secure workplace for women. Uh, whether it's in terms of having creches for women with children, for lactating mothers, which we have in the Supreme Court, uh, whether it's in terms of creating a bar room for women. Uh, in this building of the Supreme Court, we have a bar room for, uh, for women, but it is, the, the demand has far outgrown the area which has been provided. So when we are going to the new building and designing the building, we have placed a great deal of importance on creating these facilities for, for litigants, for, for women in particular, and for, for pregnant women, for senior citizens. A uh, very simple change can help women who are, uh, you know, who, pregnant women uh, by having greater recourse to video conferencing and hybrid hearings. Uh, typically, a woman who is, uh, you know, likely to be delivering a child in the next few weeks or months may find it a little difficult to traverse the way all the way to the court. But if they are sitting at home or in their offices and they are addressing arguments online before the court, that's safe, it comports with your health and it ensures that you continue to do your work as, as, as a responsible member of the workforce. So these are things which we need to look at, not in, in terms of just a one-off measure, but institutionalizing it. And my concern as Chief Justice is to adopt something, adopt policies and implement policies in a manner where they become a part of the system for the future. It shouldn't be something which is, you know, peculiar to one Chief Justice. And then, you know, it sort of continues so long as that Chief Justice is in office. But it be must become an institutionalized practice so that then it becomes part of the system and then your successors, the other people in the staff who will follow over the years, they will build on what has been done. Crashes in the Supreme Court and a place where lactating mothers can go and, you know, serve their kid, etc. Just the best thing that we want to hear this morning as well. But let's move on from what's happening in the Supreme Court to what's happening on the streets of not just the national capital, but also here in Mumbai. Did you know which is the best sandwich in the world? Well, maybe not the best sandwich, but the top 10 sandwiches said to be the best in the world. One of them is actually Vada Pao, believe it or not. And the second one that made it to the list was actually Shawarma. This, of course, started a whole debate between Mumbai and Delhi saying which sandwich or which Vada Pao versus Shawarma, which one is actually better. So the producers at Money Control went out and they did a taste test. Take a look. Don't 
underestimate the power of the humble vada pav they say cuz amchi mumbai staple food is not only making its way to our tummies and plates across india but is now getting global recognition that's right our staple humble vada pav here in mumbai is now among the top 20 best sandwiches in the world this according to the march 2024 list put out by taste atlas which is a travel and food guide platform has made sure that amchi mumbai's vada pav finds its place yes it's ranked 19th but what's there not to like in a vada pav that crispy potato patty surrounded by that nice soft fluffy bun and the medley of the chutneys oh my god my mouth is already watering i know your mouth is watering stacy but hold on guess who is number 3 on the very list you were speaking about it's the shawarma and what better place in the streets of delhi to check out this middle eastern dish well to do a taste check i have come to delhi's hot spot for shawarma al bake in new friends colony is famous and technically city's go to place for shawarma so let's dig in heaven amazing i finally managed to get my hands on the vada pav rakta hold on i'm sure the shawarma is great at al bakes but it cannot beat a vada pav when it comes to cost i'm here at ashok vada pav in which is outside kirti college and it's synonymous to what a vada pav means to a mumbai girl and these lines here can tell you what exactly and can vouch for what it is but let me give you a quick back story on why the vada pav is so famous in mumbai of course it is the affordability and the fact that you can find it in any nook and corner that you go to but it all started back in the 1960s and 70s when ashok wai there a street vendor who had a stall next to dadar station decided that perfect food should be something that is transportable easily affordable and also simple to make and that's where the humble vada pav came into being but of course over the years we've seen that vada pav has seen different transformations we've seen shezwan vada pav to a cheese vada pav and the likes but when it comes to cost and down vada pav is the winner well not so easily ha stacy let's ask janta about their choice and settle this for once so what's your preference vada pav or shawarma any time shawarma any time shawarma definitely vada pav because my kid loves it seriously and he generally whenever i'm travel to bombay he generally tells me mama please get the vada pav mama please get the vada pav hum sabse zyada yahan shawarma hi khane ke liye aate hain vada pav and shawarma my choice will always be vada pav vada pav i choose shawarma <laughs> shawarma vada pav khaye nahi madam yahan pe aake isliye hum shawarma khate hain i am a non veg lover so i will choose shawarma who eats veg ras vegetarians we will always prefer this which is always on the top mumbai ka to sabka pasandida food hai saste mein milta hai acha milta hai i like the lasun chutney and the flavor that it has the potato everything about vada pav actually it makes less of a mess khane mein easy hai kahin bhi chalte chalte kha sakte hain sasta bhi milta hai aur kya chahiye vada pav should be among the top 5 i have puri duniya ke sandwiches to khaye nahi but india mein to i'll say it is the number 1 okay stacy i'll let you have your moment as long as an indian dish is making global appeal we all can bask in the glory but still what would you choose shawarma or vada pav let us know in the comments Yeah so what do you prefer shawarma or vada pav you can let us know as well we'll send our producers back and let them also come out with some of the best in the cities as well on that note we're going to slip into the first break coming up on the other side all the IPL action and all eyes tonight are going to be on Chennai Super Kings versus Gujarat Titans both captains are having quite a moment we'll bring you the details in a bit Kavita she has been arrested and whisked away by the enforcement directorate she is also obviously extremely upset right now given the fact that others in the liquor gate scam have not really had their way in the court of law Mr Sen the election commissioners were always selected by the prime minister earlier as well in fact now there is a three member committee it wasn't so early
why should we believe that just like Bengal was a breakout for the BJP in 2019, that the South will not be one for the BJP this time? Mr. Vivek Srivastava, you are not, as per your political ideology, allowed to define any religious faith. So don't attach any meaning to it without understanding what Hindutva actually is, sir. Friends, 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 friends. NHS, the National Health Service in the UK, seems to be in big trouble and is now turning to India for solutions. The NHS is UK's publicly funded healthcare system and the entire population of UK is covered by the NHS and the majority of health services there are absolutely free. In fact, NHS can be described as the closest thing Britain actually has to the national religion of sorts. It's cherished deeply. Its levels of public support higher than that of the royal family as well and of many other British institutions. NHS remains the biggest source of national pride for its people and for the country, but it now stands at a critical juncture, facing challenges that require urgent.
Welcome back. Now, the Indian Premier League witnessed a manic first few days of cricket with close finishes in the bowling side reigning in the opposition batters with confidence. Of course, the exception to that rule has to be the first Kohli and a feisty middle order which notched up their first win and at home. Tonight, we will see Chennai Super Kings take on Gujarat Titans and the second game for both of these teams. Both Rituraj Gaikwad and Chubban Gill will be heading into, uh, into the strong momentum as well with super wins from their opening games as well. So the city of Chennai will be above will the finalists of 2023 facing off at the stadium. But the biggest talking point of the IPL so far has been Gujarat's former captain and Mumbai Indians current skipper Hardik Pandya. Hardik Pandya replacing Rohit Sharma at the help hasn't gone down too well with the fans. Fans at the Ahmedabad Narendra Modi Stadium booed Hardik Pandya and during Gujarat Titans versus the Mumbai Indians match over the weekend. Fans also chanted Rohit Sharma's name instead. What transpired and how does that boo entire uh, thing impact Mumbai's campaign ahead as well? Uh, this is sports editor of uh, First Post, Rupa Ramani with more. Right, top pointers from the weekend. All young guns and new captains started off with wins. Hyderabad lost a cliffhanger. Sanju Samson stamped his class yet again. We'll have to wait and see if the consistency also comes along. Rishabh Panth made a hesitant yet heartwarming return to international cricket. Sam Curran, who was a bowler who could bat a bit, is proving to be a batter who can also bowl. But the story of the weekend came from Gujarat versus Mumbai encounter. Would you ever imagine an Indian cricketer being booed in India, in any part of the country really, and worse, in his own home city. I'll tell you one thing, it's not fun being Hardik Pandya at this point. It was the most anticipated match of the first weekend of the league and lived up to all the hype as well. A lot of predictable plot lines came through that game. Shubman Gill gave a good start, did not convert. Both the sides, Sudarshan and Kishore, played key roles for their franchise Gujarat with bat and ball. Rohit Sharma was the rock of the Mumbai batting. The talented young Dewal Brew is sparkled. Ishan Kishan fished too early and walked off with a duck and the ever-impactful Jaspreet Bumrah dazzled everyone. It was a last over finish and Hardik Pandya was booed in his own city. All boxes ticked. No one would want to be in Hardik Pandya's shoes. Picture this, a new franchise, Gujarat Titans, appoints Hardik Pandya as their new leader to lead them into the future, to build a legacy of sorts with him as the face of it all. And what a start to their journey it was. They won the inaugural edition despite being written off. And they continued their dominant run in the next season, reaching the final in 2023. After all of that, only to jump ship and move back to Mumbai. And as captain no less, has indeed backfired. Fans of Mumbai are upset and have massively boycotted Hardik. Fans of Ahmedabad do feel that he betrayed them. So basically, Hardik has nowhere to go. Yesterday saw all of that spill over on the ground to the ground. It was a cracker of a contest though. The crowd booed Hartig as soon as he came to the toss. They booed him as soon as he came into bowl first and booed him as soon as he came into bat as well. Basically, they booed him every time he was involved in the game. Screaming Rohit Sharma's name instead. A sight that no Indian cricketer of any stature and surely not a captain of any team has seen. And it was most unusual. Hardik Pandya opened the bowling, which he has never done before, and he came way low down the order while batting, which he didn't do the last two seasons with Gujarat. A collective team decision, says batting coach Kiran Pollard later, but here's the thing, he took charge like a captain would. He did not miss too many tricks, and Mumbai pretty much had this in the bag. He directed the field, he even sent the former captain Rohit Sharma to field onto the roops. Something Rohit Sharma's fans vented about. Now, all I would say to that is captains, even the best fielding captains like Virat Kohli, for example, have fielded on the, on the ropes. If your captain wants the best fielders in a certain position, that's only a good thing. And that is what Hardik was possibly doing. But fans and the 88,000 capacity crowd at the Narendra Modi Stadium did not think so and did not quite like that. Hardik, though, went on about his business and with the focus that he would have had any other time. Mumbai took the game quite close. They were in control too, but that stifling spell by Tsai Kishore probably broke the momentum. Mohit Sharma as well coming right back into the game and bringing Gujarat back in with it. A few wickets falling and suddenly the simple equation had changed into a difficult one. With a steep ask of 19 of 6, Hardik Pandya walks in and the crowd is livid. The boos and heckles are insanely loud. Hardik strikes Umesh Yadav for a 6 and the crowd is silenced. 
Some field changes later and the Numesh runs in again. Hardik slaps the ball to the ropes and suddenly the crowd is tense because they know that Hardik could change this. 9 of 4 is game on. But the tension is short-lived. Umesh pitches it a little short and that's the end of Hardik Pandya and the Mumbai resistance as well. But you have to give it to Hardik for putting up a brave face and backing the youngsters who came in ahead of him but failed to deliver. It was a tough act out in the middle and a tough, tough night for him. At that post-match interaction, he backed the decisions taken by the batters who came in before him. And the commentators were also torn between feeling sad for him and stating the obvious. And if you think he will get some respite, at least in his home matches, well, think again. Wang Kede will be a cauldron and the booze may just be as disturbing there. The situation needs some mending, especially after you see some heated exchanges between Rohit Sharma and Hardik Pandya after the game. But we don't know. We don't want to get too much into speculations here. But before they even think of getting to mending this, maybe the best that they, that can be done is by getting the results right. Nothing short of a dream season is what can tide the fans' ire and transform all the hate. Well, do keep following us here though as we continue to pick up key talking points from the Indian Premier League only on our coverage here on First Sports, which is T20 Summer Storm. That's right. You can catch up all the coverage on brands across the Network 18 system as well. But let's move on now and shift gears to some news coming in from the world of auto. And our friends at Overdrive have a new real car that they tried their hands on. It's the new BMW iX1. Now, remember, we've been talking about how the summer this time around are going to see a lot of cars being released. This one, of course, has been in the feature and has caught on to a lot of attention. So, of course, Overdrive tried their hands on it. Take a look. This is the BMW iX1 and is this electric version of the X1 the one you really should be considering? The iX1 has a surprising amount of engagement to offer you as a driver given that it's an electric SUV. To start with, the seating position is quite natural, not too high or too low for an SUV. But much of this is down to the fact that it puts out 313 PS and 494 Nm via an AWD setup through a motor on each axle. In our tests, we saw 0 to 100 kmph strength of 5.3 seconds and some blistering rolling acceleration times, enough to keep up with some serious performance cars. So on the move, power builds, of course, with that immediacy that you expect from an EV, but it's also measured. So it'll build in a linear, clean swell that's very easy to get used to. So in any situation, you know exactly what the drivetrain is doing, and that really helps you get used to say EV driving very easily. And another great trait is that this performance keeps going well past triple digit speed. So even if you are at, on the highway, even in the lowest modes, there's really no problem in the way the iX1 delivers performance and of course, given the output, there is a lot of it. Switch it to the efficiency mode, there too it's very usable, it, you can pretty much use it daily in that mode even at higher speed. And conversely, switch it into sport and this thing really does wake up. The responses from the throttle, they're already quite precise, they sharpen up quite a bit. Diesel X1, which is this boost mode, and here it really does feel even more effective considering it's just giving you the full outputs very instantly. So in that sense, it's really quite exciting. The iX1 is powered by a 66.4 kWh lithium-ion battery pack. The WLTP range is up to 440 km and in our real-world testing, we found that it gets quite close to this figure, managing 431 km. One of the factors helping this is that the iX1 seems to have quite an efficient regen program being able to recuperate a good deal of energy even the lowest modes. The drive modes are also well calibrated and the iX1's efficiency doesn't plummet at highway speeds. The motor's efficiency and the good 0.26 drag coefficient may be factors helping this. Charging speeds are also reasonable if not class leading. The BMW will DC fast charge at up to 135 kW, which needs 29 minutes to get from 10 to 80%. The 11 kW AC charger takes 6.3 hours to fully top up the battery. So yeah, while it is quite potent, you do miss the sound that would have sort of made it a bit more engaging. But what really strikes you with the iX1 isn't the performance, to be honest. It's, again, the 
really quite fine balance between ride and handling that BMW has been able to manage. So first off is the ride, even though this is an EV, it doesn't feel any less splash than the regular X1. So it's very well damped. So even at low speeds over rough roads, it has that fluid, that sort of slightly soft edge to it that really helps. And this hasn't come at the cost of handling. As you can see, we're on some pretty good driving roads in here too. You have that all-wheel drive grip first off, which the regular X1 doesn't have, and that really shows in the kind of speeds that you can carry here and the kind of performance that you can extract from this car. And of course, you have that usual EV trait of all the weight being low down. So that also means that body movements are really quite well controlled. So you have a sense of confidence driving around corners and really getting the most out of this powertrain. So And also aiding this is the steering so in various modes it will so depending on the modes it will either lighten up or become a touch more heftier and direct but of course you can't forget the fact that this is an EV and it is quite heavy so if you are a bit too enthusiastic you will notice that it starts to feel that it will run wide but it does have a torque vectoring by braking system that really does work quite effectively to reel you back in. You'll be hard pressed to tell the BMW iX1 apart from the regular X1 from afar. Look closer and the giveaways are the blanked out grille which in this M Sport version still mimics that of an IC BMW and the blue outline for the BMW badges. So like with the X1, this EV2 carries a good deal of presence with its upright stance and the expressive face. But you do notice a 13mm reduction in ground clearance and the way the SUV feels a touch more hunkered down. At the rear, 3D detailing to the lights is still quite eye-catching and like the front, the contrasting black surfaces seem to cut down the iX1's mass to good effect. This electric SUV manages to exude a degree of sportiness helped by the quite traditional M Sport alloys. Yes, the reduced ground clearance means you will have to be careful over the larger speed breakers and the spare wheel is now just packed into the boot, eating into space. Now, the only way you will be able to tell that this is the electric iX from within here is through this blue outlining to the BMW badge here and if you look very closely the B brake board version here of the gear selector. But aside from that that's not really a bad thing because what you get is an interior that is right up there with the best at this price point. So yeah you have this very open and contemporary feeling space here which there is some giveaway to practicality for example these spaces that don't hold things tightly in place which can be a bit of an issue but you do get this very neat wireless charging arrangement but what really steps this cabin to the next level is the sheer quality of materials and finishes so of course all of this is soft materials even right down here the it's not soft but it's done to a very good standard the plastics but the metals for example this bit feels cold to the touch this has this textured finish the hair from the vents and these there aren't too many buttons as usual but what is there is well done here Similarly for the steering wheel, it's one of the nicer wheels to hold. You still get hard buttons, so it's very easy to control this screen through here and set the cruise control. So in that sense, you do feel you've spent money well here. The tech setup is also shared with the ICX1. Yes, the 10.25 inch driver's display sees some change with EV specific information and this is presented quite neatly. Again, the idea seems to be to ease you into electric mobility naturally. The screen is easy to navigate and customizable to a good extent. The 10.7 inch touchscreen continues with its touch heavy interface. Most of the bugs from earlier seem to have been fixed. So while it does take a while to get used to some functions like the climate control and drive modes, it's a more fluid experience than earlier. The BMW iX1 gets the same features as the regular X1. So some of the highlights include massaging front seats, a panoramic sunroof, 12 speaker, Harman Kardon audio, leather upholstery, ambient lighting and connected features. There's a good deal of safety equipment to your emergency braking and lane departure warning as well as a brake based differential locking function and hill descent control. You also have an active park feature but we would have also liked blind spot monitoring and 360 degree cameras. Now the differences are slightly more apparent here because you notice that with the slightly raised floor to accommodate the battery pack you sit in a bit of a knees up position and but that's mainly noticed with a lack of lumbar support it's not as good as in the IC version but in terms of space and the feeling from behind here aside from this 
difference it's again very similar so you have good place to put your feet in here as you can see a good amount of knee room for me headroom is also pretty decent and the other seats themselves they are pretty comfortable the backrest especially since you can also recline it and yeah like the front you have quite an airy feeling with the large glass area that's then and again this water glass which is quite large really does work and add to that sense of space in this cabin and like at the front there are a decent degree of storage spaces although again but again this space could have been more secure to if you could just put your phone in here but the pockets are large and of course you also have a center armrest Price to rupees seventy point seven zero lakh on road Mumbai. You pay about rupees seven lakh more from the BMW iX1 over the diesel X1. We think this makes it a great pick if you're looking for the added performance and handling chops. The usual EV positive aside, you don't have the immense range of the diesel X1, but the iX1 is arguably more engaging to drive without sacrificing on comfort. You also don't lose out on practicality or equipment. A win-win. A win-win says overdrive over there, but let's move on to some wins that are happening in the field of healthcare. We've heard of transplants, and India is really acing the game when it comes to that. But there's always been transplants of one human to the other. Now, what has happened is that there has been a successful pig kidney transplant into a human. Here's how exactly it happened. It was truly the most beautiful kidney I have ever seen. Transplant surgeon Dr. Tatsuo Kawai and his team are hailing what they call a major breakthrough after what they say is the first ever successful transplant of a pig kidney into a live human patient. Kawai described the moment after the kidney was hooked up to the 62-year-old man who had end-stage renal disease. Upon restoration of blood flow into the kidneys, the kidney picked up immediately and started to make urine. When we saw the first urine output, everyone in the operating room burst in applause. The four-hour surgery was performed on March 16th at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. The hospital said the patient is recovering well and set to be discharged soon. He had received a human kidney transplant at the same hospital in 2018 after seven years on dialysis. But the organ failed five years later, putting him back on dialysis. His new kidney was provided by biotech company eGenesis from a pig with about the same sized organs that had been genetically edited to remove genes that could be harmful to a human recipient. Certain human genes were also added to improve compatibility. And some viruses inherent to pigs with the potential to infect humans were inactivated. The renal experts are hoping the transplanted organ will last at least two years. eGenesis CEO Dr. Mike Curtis sees the surgery as a milestone that could turn hope into reality for the queue of some 90,000 Americans waiting for donor kidneys. Many of those patients will spend their final days on dialysis. That's just the patients on the transplant waiting list. If we look more broadly at the patients with kidney failure on dialysis, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of patients who could benefit from a kidney transplant. And the reality is with our current cadaveric kidney donation system, it's just insufficient to fill that need. Researchers have been working for decades on the possibility of using animal organs for transplants, known as xenotransplantation, but rejection by the human body has been a stumbling block. In 2021, NYU surgeons had successfully transplanted a genetically modified pig kidney into a brain-dead patient whose family consented to the experiment shortly before life support was due to be switched off. All right, what a marvel over there. But with that, let's take a look at what else is happening in India and across the world. Purple Day stands as a testament to solidarity and education on March 26 each year. Initiated by Cassidy Megan, a young Canadian in 2008, the day has transcended borders with more than 85 countries worldwide, joining in last year to don the purple and host events in support of epilepsy awareness. 
Holy Tuesday emerges as a pivotal movement for Christians worldwide. This day, also revered as the Great and the Holy Tuesday, serves as a time of deep contemplation and spiritual introspection as believers reflect on the profound teachings and interactions of Jesus Christ in the lead up to his crucifixion and resurrection. Anticipation mounts as tech enthusiasts eagerly await the new Apple regarding much awaited anticipated release of the new iPad models. Now speculation is rife that the company might make an announcement today offering a glimpse into the future of its popular tablet lineup. In the hush money criminal case, judge ruled that the trial against former US President Donald Trump will begin on April 15th. During the hearing on Monday, which Trump attended, the judge dismissed the former president's motion to toss out the indictment altogether or delay the trial further. In a major legal relief for Donald Trump, a New York State Appeals Court ordered Trump to enter a bond of $175 million within the next 10 days, staying enforcement of $454 million judgment against him and his company in his civil fraud case. The United Nations Security Council has taken decisive action, passing a resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire between Israel and the Palestinian group Hamas. The resolution also calls for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages. Notably, the abstention of the United States from the vote underscores the complexity of the international diplomacy surrounding the long-standing conflict. With particles from the sun hurtling towards our planet, the northern lights, typically confined to the northern latitudes, are poised to illuminate the skies across the US and the UK, offering a rare opportunity for spectators to witness this mesmerizing phenomena. As anticipation mounts for this spectacular event, the stage is set for a night of awe-inspiring beauty. Dubbed sites of extraordinary scientific importance, these pristine locations on the moon offer unparalleled conditions for groundbreaking research, shielded from Earth's interference and boasting the optimal environments for sensitive instrumentation. However, with an impending surge of lunar missions, including navigation satellites and mining operations, experts warn of the urgent need to protect these invaluable sites before they succumb to irreversible damage. In the wake of the ongoing turbulence surrounding the Boeing 737 MAX crisis, CEO Dave Calhoun announces his forthcoming departure, marking a significant shift in the leadership for the embattled aerospace giant. The decision is a part of a broader management overhaul, with Chairman Larry Kellner also stepping down amidst escalating calls for reform within the company amidst a series of quality and manufacturing issues plaguing the Boeing claims. Alright, with that, it's a wrap on today's edition of The Breakfast Club. We'll see you again tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. Until then, stay good. Have a good day. Kavita, she has been arrested and whisked away by the Enforcement Directorate. She's also obviously extremely upset right now, given the fact that others in the liquor gate scam have not really had their way in the court of law. Mr. Sen, the election commissioners were always selected by the Prime Minister earlier as well. In fact, now there is a three-member committee. It wasn't That's so that way. Why should we believe that just like Bengal was a breakout for the BJP in 2019, that the South will not be one for the BJP this time?
Minister Vivek Srivastava. You are not, as per your political ideology, allowed to define any religious faith. So don't attach any meaning to it without understanding what Hindutva actually is, sir. Delivery boy. NHS was established post the World War II and recently the UK Prime Minister there, Rishi Sonak, whose parents were also NHS doctors and pharmacists, paid a tribute, uh, tribute to the NHS and outlined a 15-year plan aimed at recruiting hundreds and thousands of new health staff. Why? Because it is recognizing that NHS is under unprecedented strain following the pandemic. Even though the government has spent nearly 12% of its budget only on healthcare, it's a single, you know, far uh, and its single biggest item on the budget. Now, demoralized doctors, nurses have been striking for better pay at aging and unfit population uh, also needs ever more complex treatments. Cancers go undiagnosed and lack of scanners in hospitals. All of these leading to a situation that is crumbling, a crumbling healthcare infrastructure for UK. Now, Rishi Sonak, the you know, the leader there now turning to India for solutions. It is now looking at hiring 2,000 doctors from India to prevent their medical system from completely collapsing. So we found out what exactly is this. Himani has the details. Himani. That's right, Sonal. NHS is in crisis and needs India's help. NHS is looking to hire about 2,000 doctors from India to prevent their medical system from collapsing. These Indian doctors will be given 6 to 12 months of training and then they will start working at hospitals in Britain. These doctors won't have to uh, take the Professional and Linguistic Assessments Board or PLAB. That's the exam uh, after they finish the training. This exam is otherwise mandatory for starting clinical practice in the UK. However, these place placements do not offer permanent se settlement facilities in the UK. For many years, the NHS has struggled to address its staff shortage due to various reasons. The UK has been depending on doctors trained in other countries for many years now. This is not the first time. In fact, in 2019, it had one of the lowest numbers of doctors per capita in Europe. But now, the problem has worsened significantly. According to global media, the NHS desperately needs more homegrown doctors, nurses, general physicians and dentists to prevent the crisis that could leave the NHS short of 5,71,000 staffers, which are all healthcare professionals. Minded, this isn't about shortages elsewhere. It's about the severe shortage hitting the healthcare sector. And if they don't fix this, the NHS might not be able to keep up with all the people needing care in their country, especially with the increasing demand due to the growing and aging population. While NHS is scouting for well-trained and experienced doctors from India, the question is, will India help? The IMA or the Indian Medical Association, which is the largest group representing doctors in India, is not very interested in helping UK. The reason is simple. They want NHS or any other organization to come to India to absorb young MBBS graduate doctors who are looking for jobs and not those who are already settled here and serving the Indian population. IMA has declined to participate in this initiative and in fact, IMA's national president Dr. R. V. Asokan told News 18 that they do not want to support the migration of skilled doctors. Hello and a very good morning to all our viewers out there. You're watching the Morning News Show on CNN News 18 and I'm Sriya Kundu here with all the latest updates of the hour and the top stories of the day from across the nation and around the world. And well, we begin the bulletin with the news that has been the top focus for us over the last couple of days ever since it developed in the national capital. Now, days after the Delhi Chief Minister's arrest, Aam Party has announced a new campaign 
to rally together its supporters and uh, the campaign is called Modi uh, Modi ka sabse bada dar Kejriwal or Modi's biggest fear is Arvind Kejriwal that is the campaign that they are starting and now Amadmi party has launched a DP campaign where all Kejriwal supporters have been asked to change their DPs in support of the Delhi chief minister now Amadmi party will also ghir out the prime minister's residence today and hold protests over Kejriwal's arrest is what we have learned so far this is as the opposition INDIA block has announced a march to save the democracy on 31st. Now, BJP, on the other hand, continues to slam the Ahmadmi party's theatrics and has said that the law is equal for all. Right now, though, we have some more breaking news coming in. This is with regards to the protest that the Ahmadmi party uh, had called for. And what we are learning is that no permission has been given for the Ahmadmi party's protest today. Because Aam Aadmi Party did not apply to take any permission from the police. Now, as a precaution, security has been increased and Section 144 has also been imposed in the areas. This is the particular breaking news that we are getting so far. Remember, what we have learned so far is today the Aam Aadmi Party is to ghirao the Prime Minister's residence in protest against Arvind Kejriwal.